Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Hey everyone, welcome to today's episode. We're going to be talking about what happens when U.S. presidents take to the skies. This comes from listener Todd Babin, who asks, can you tell me about presidents who fought in military battles in various wars? So I get questions like these that are pretty simple. They're sort of an A, B, true or false type of question. If I want to make this episode really, really short, I could just say, yes, one of the best known examples of military aviators was George H.W. Bush, the 41st president, one of the youngest naval aviators of World War II, and probably the best known pilot president. Another example is his son, although he didn't serve in combat, but he was a member of the Texas Air National Guard during the Vietnam War. Okay, that is a very short answer to this question. But as you know, in this podcast, what I like to do is take seemingly simple questions, really dig in deep into the question behind the question and explore all the different twists and turns that this can take us as we look into the past and different people. The question behind the question could be different, such as, Presidents who fought in wars as aviators, what does it say about them? What was their character? Were they more prone to taking risky measures? Did it affect their leadership style? Would they be more decisive and bold as a national leader if they were a military aviator than people who served in so-called safer parts of the armed forces? Although there's not many parts of the armed forces that are that safe or those who didn't serve at all. Was there something different about their leadership? What does this tell us about the president? So that's sort of the angle that I'm going to be looking at it from this question. What I'll be doing in this episode is, first of all, I'll give a general overview of presidents and their connection to aviation. Then I'll really dig into what did it look like to fly at different times in history. If you were Franklin Roosevelt and the first president to fly on what became called Air Force One, what was it like to fly on a plane in the early 1940s? Probably a very different and much less safe experience than in the 1990s or the 2000s. So let me dive into a more detailed answer, and then we'll really get into the nitty gritty in this episode. Franklin D. Roosevelt is the first sitting president to fly in an aircraft. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower was the first president to travel in an airplane with the designation Air Force One. But the first president who flew when he wasn't a sitting president was Theodore Roosevelt. And he flew in October 1910. This is only a few years after the Wright brothers. This is when flight is a very rickety, very dangerous hobby. It's similar to extreme sports today, like base jumping or paragliding. Something that if you're not under controlled supervision of a professional, you could very likely die. And I think that fits Theodore Roosevelt perfectly. So almost all presidents since FDR have flown as passengers. But there are a few who went from manning an aircraft to running a country. And the U.S. has had a fair amount of aviators turn leaders, just about more than any other country. I can't exactly say the why of that, but at the end of this episode, I will look at the profiles of famous world leaders who were military aviators and offer a few suggestions and you can take it from there. The history of presidential aviation, like I said, goes back to 1910, when former commander-in-chief Teddy Roosevelt, who was no longer president at the time, enjoyed a brief spin in a Wright biplane. He described the trip as, quote, the bulliest experience I ever had. And if Roosevelt calls it the bulliest experience ever, that really says something. Considering he went on African safaris, he worked as a rancher in the Dakota Badlands and arrested bandits and spent about 30 hours or so taking them to arrest. He gave a 90-minute speech after being shot. That really says something. So this happened on October 11, 1910, when Theodore Roosevelt, who just left office, boarded an airplane and became the first U.S. president to experience flight. The event is captured on video. I think you can find it on YouTube. He didn't fly alone. He was with pilot Archibald Hoxie, a pioneer aviator, who approached Roosevelt with a request as his motorcade stopped to view the events of the air meet. So this was an impromptu decision. After some discussion, the statesman rose from his seat and shed his coat. Here's how news reports from the time described how it went down. Roosevelt removed his slouch hat and borrowed a gray golf cap, which he pulled over his eyes. He watched the aviator's preparations with a smile of satisfaction, betraying not the least nervousness. 
The report went on to describe the flight, saying, The plane traveled twice around the aviation field in 3 minutes and 20 seconds. Roosevelt waved his hands at the crowd of thousands on the field below. When the machine alighted easily, a few feet from the starting place, a mighty shout of applause went up. The event took place in what was originally known as the Permanent Aviation Field and Dirigible Harbor, but became known as Kinloch Flying Field. So that's Roosevelt's experience in flight, but then we hit pause for a few decades. Remember, flight is still in its infancy, and for a head of state or president to fly at this period would be like for a politician to go on the space shuttle. It's an activity that's restricted to the very few because at this point it is still very experimental and very dangerous. Flight is a part of World War I, famously with the Red Baron and other figures, but aviation isn't integrated into the military strategy of combined arms in the way that it would be in World War II or even in the 1930s with the Spanish Civil War. For a few decades, presidents don't even fly when they're in office. They prefer railroad travel, and the duties of the chief executive don't require the amount of extensive travel than it does today, and there's not the expectation that the president himself personally arrives at different events, personally campaigns in the way he does today. So there's not a pressure for presidents in the 1920s, the Calvin Coolidge's, the Warren Hardings, and others to actually get on a plane because it's not well developed at this time. Now, we do start to see men who would later become presidents have experiences with aviation. One of them is Dwight Eisenhower, who was the 34th president and served two terms from 1953 to 1961. He was the first president to fly in a plane called Air Force One, the first president to use a helicopter, one in office, in 1957, and one of the first presidents to fly as a military aviator. Eisenhower graduated from West Point in 1915. He requested an assignment in the Philippines, but 2nd Lieutenant Eisenhower was instead assigned to the 19th Infantry at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio. He worked in logistics until 1918. He was promoted to captain the year before, and when the United States entered World War I, he requested an overseas assignment but was denied. He eventually received orders for the new tank corps and was promoted to brevet lieutenant colonel in the National Army. He never saw combat but continued to work in the military despite its difficulties post-war. In the 1930s, Eisenhower was posted as chief military aide to General MacArthur, the Army Chief of Staff. In 1935, he accompanied MacArthur to the Philippines. There, he served as an assistant military advisor to the Philippine government in developing their army. Eisenhower was promoted to lieutenant colonel in 1936, and it was during this time when Eisenhower learned to fly. In 37, he made a solo flight over the Philippines, and in 39, he obtained a private pilot's license at Fort Lewis. Because Eisenhower earned a private pilot's license, he was never rated as a military pilot. So, being a pilot wasn't technically part of his military career. The fact that he could fly and wasn't just a passenger is an important achievement that few U.S. presidents could brag about. I should also point out here, this will be no surprise to those who have any familiarity with the military, but above a certain rank of officer, you simply are not going to be on the front lines of combat. For me as a historian, since I've never served in the military, this was something that took me a while to wrap my mind around. And what I mean by that is that in fiction, things like Star Trek, where the captain will go on an away mission and personally put himself in front lines of danger, the analogy I've heard from others would be as if FDR, Joseph Stalin, and Winston Churchill personally went across Europe and personally gunned down and punched Nazis. That would be absolutely ludicrous because heads of state wouldn't be anywhere near the dangers of combat because they're simply too important. That's true of high-ranking officers as well. And what that means is when we talk about flight and presidents involved with it, we're not going to see any heads of state being close to combat danger in the way that you would have aviation officers. Again, if you have involvement in the military, you're probably rolling your eyes at how obvious that is. But for those who do not have military experience, you would be shocked at what civilians like us miss out on. But probably the most famous example of a military aviator is George H.W. Bush, Bush 41. He was the 41st president of the United States from 1989 to 1993. Before being president, he was the vice president with Ronald Reagan. He was a congressman, ambassador, director of the CIA, and one of the youngest naval aviators of World War II, and has one of the most impressive track records of pilot presidents. Bush decided to join the Navy after the attack on Pearl Harbor. After graduating from the Phillips Academy in 1942, 
He became a naval aviator at only 18 years of age. In 1943, he was commissioned as an ensign in the U.S. Naval Reserve at the Naval Air Station Corpus Christi. This was only three days before his 19th birthday. In September 1943, Bush was assigned to Torpedo Squadron VT-51 as a photographic officer. In 44, he was based in the USS San Jacinto Navy aircraft carrier as a member of Air Group 51. They were victorious in one of the biggest battles in World War II, the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Bush was promoted to lieutenant in August 1944, and when his squadron commenced operations against the Japanese in the Bonin Islands, Bush piloted a Grumman TBM Avenger that was one of four aircraft that attacked a small naval base at Chichijima. During the attack, they encountered several anti-aircraft fire, and Bush's Avenger was hit, and I'll get into way more detail with this. He managed to complete his task even though his aircraft caught fire and released his bombs over his target. He was able to fly several miles away and then bail out of the aircraft, but his fellow crew members' parachutes didn't open and they weren't so lucky. He served until September 1945 when the war wound down after Japan surrendered. So overall, Bush flew 58 combat missions, and for those missions, he received the Distinguished Flying Cross and three air medals. Now let's get back into Bush 41's actual experience where he almost died. Soldiers who fought in World War II, the deadliest conflict in history, had a number of risky jobs and few were as dangerous as flying an airplane. It was dangerous even if you weren't in combat because planes didn't have pressurized cabins and airmen had to wear oxygen masks and wear heavy wool coats in order to stay warm. Richard Overy, author of a number of World War II books, one of them called The Bombers and the Bombed, Allied War over Europe, 1940-1945, notes that technical problems were common on aircraft mass-produced and not always properly checked. Thousands of U.S. warplanes never even made it to the front, and they would crash instead during training or en route to combat. Bush himself crash-landed during a practice bombing run in Virginia. He managed to escape unscathed despite totaling his plane. Later, Bush witnessed a fellow pilot panic and smash right into an aircraft carrier's landing crew, showing how pilot stress and fear could turn deadly just by trying to land your plane. And the fighting after frequent missions took a harsh toll on airmen who confronted anti-aircraft fire from below and fire from enemy planes in the sky with only a tiny hole to protect them. Being shot at in a plane could be so nerve-wracking that one British paratrooper spoke of how on D-Day he couldn't wait to jump out behind enemy lines, he said, where we knew we would be safer. In fact, U.S. airmen made up nearly one quarter of U.S. deaths in World War II. About 100,000 U.S. airmen died in World War II, representing nearly one quarter of total U.S. fatalities. And the U.S. lost almost 100,000 of its 300,000 planes produced during World War II. It wasn't due to one big battle, but it was just a slow attrition as fighters and bombers went out night after night after night. The U.S. 8th Air Force, which bombed German-occupied Europe from 1942 onward, lost more than 26,000 men, one-third of its total aircrew. Few bomber pilots managed to survive, maybe 50 missions like Bush, but it was extremely rare. Many pilots were burned out after 30. So about 25% of pilots would be killed or seriously injured each month in peak combat, and in some battles, the loss rate reaches high as 40%. So here's how Bush was nearly one of those casualties, in which he first saw action in May 1944 at the head of a three-man Avenger torpedo bomber. At dawn on September 2nd, 1944, Bush was slated to fly in a strike over Chichijima, a Japanese island about 500 miles from the Japanese mainland. The island was targeted because it was a stronghold for communications and supply for the Japanese, and it was heavily guarded. Bush specifically wanted to target a radio tower. Around 7.15 that morning, Bush took off through clear skies along with William White, known as Ted, and John Dell Delaney. An hour later, their plane was hit. Smoke filled the cockpit and flames swallowed the wings. Bush radioed Delaney and White to put on their parachutes. Bush later wrote, when he was hit, suddenly there was a jolt, as if a massive fist had crunched into the belly of the plane. Smoke poured into the cockpit and I could see flames rippling across the crease of the wing, edging toward the fuel tanks. Bush managed to drop his four 500-pound bombs on the target, and subsequently bailed out over the ocean, but when he did so, he bonked his head on the plane's tail and ripped part of his parachute. 
He managed still to splash into the 